Using lighting techniques such as three-point lighting or the four-point studio lighting is all very well if you're only ever going to be taking your shot from one camera angle and the camera angle isn't really going to move. But what happens if we wish to take this camera angle, so this one here, and we want to maybe change the perspective that the camera's in? What happens if, you know, I want to say, well, you know, I'm going to take the target, we'll put it more in the center here, and then that's going to actually give me a lot of scope to be able to change what angle I want to do the render from, or what position, or even what orientation. You're kind of slightly limited at that point, because you then have to start moving all your lighting scheme around every time you want to move the camera. There is, however, you'll be pleased to know, a slightly easier way of doing things, and that's to use something called a sky dome. Now, traditionally, sky domes were a set of lights that were created in, surprisingly enough, uh, a dome uh, sort of configuration. We have in 3D Studio Max something called a skylight, which is exactly that, it's a dome light. So I'm going to come up here to my Create tab and go all the way over to Lights, and then instead of Photometric, I'm going to pick Standard from that drop-down, and you can see here the one option we've got is Skylight. So I'm going to click once, and that will enable my Skylight, and then I'm just going to left-click in the viewport. Now it doesn't really matter where you put it exactly in your viewport, and that is to say it doesn't have to be right in the center of your scene. It will still create the same effect, um, provided it's in sort of, you know, a reasonably sensible position. One thing you will notice, though, is that this skylight is still highlighted here, which means if I was to left-click in my scene again, I would actually create more skylights. And this would actually create a problem for us later on in the rendering, because obviously any light that would be emitted into the scene from the skylight has now been multiplied by four times with these three extra skylights in the scene. So what I've done with putting my one skylight in the scene, I'm going to right click, and you can see there that deselects, and I will just marquee select these three and I'll press delete and I'll get rid of them. So now that I've added that skylight into the scene, let's have a look at a few of its parameters. We'll highlight it and we'll go to our modify panel. First thing to notice here is that it has a, a standard multiplier value, similar to the ones that you get with all your other lights. And we've also got a skylight colour here. We can use our scene environment colour, and that is if I was to come up to rendering, and if I was going to, going to go to my environment tab, you can see this is the colour here that it would use. Uh, so I don't necessarily want to use black. Uh, I could put a gradient in there that would make it more interesting, or a light blue colour or something like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to specify a specific sky colour. What that's going to be is I'm going to left click on this white tab because we never see white in nature. Do you? You never see that there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a nice sort of basic colour around about here that gives me a good blue gradient. And I'm just going to move this off the white and put it very, very slightly into the blue. Now, Hopefully you can see the values that I've got here for the HSV. Um, this is generally where I put mine. It's never these exact numbers. It's always sort of on or round about these values. So do take them as a starting point, but please don't take them as being gospel as to that's what, uh, that's what should be used. So I'll click OK to that, and that's given me a very light colour here. I can also add a image into here. This, and this is part of our Im image-based lighting, which we'll maybe discuss a little bit later. I could say, cast shadows here, and we would get a number of rays per sample. Now, when you see the word sample here, what you want to do is you want to substitute that for the word pixel. So that's how many rays per sample is how many rays per pixel. So it's 20 rays per pixel, which is, isn't a huge amount, but it's okay. Uh, and the ray bias is really how far offset the shadow is going to be from the surface. So if I was to now come to my render setting, I need to just move my options along there and I'll go to my render setup just first of all and I'll check that I'm set in my default scanline renderer which I am and I'm going to uh, set my renderer to be 640 480. I'm just going to press the render button now and we'll have a look at the result that we get from this and the first thing that you can say is that yes we are getting a result we're using the standard scanline renderer 
But what's happening is it's it's actually taking quite a while to sort of do this scan line here. It's taking a little while for this to come down. And also the result isn't maybe as good as it could be. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause here and we'll wait for it to finish. Now, coming back to the uh, to the render here, let's just have a look at it a little bit. Um, we've kind of got some shadowy areas in here, but it also looks, and I hope you can see this on, on, uh, on the video, is that there's a lot of very, very sort of fine speckle, like a very, very fine noise. And there's not a huge amount of detail in here either. So I'm not entirely happy with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just close that down for a moment. Actually, I think what I'll do first of all is I'll make a copy of that and I'll minimize that copy and then I will close this down. You can see we've got our copy down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my advanced lighting tab within my scanline renderer. And you'll notice that it says at the moment that there's no plugin turned on. So what I'll do is from that drop down, I'll pick my light tracer plugin. And I'm not going to talk about any of these for the moment. What I'm first going to do is I'm just going to press render and we'll have a look at the difference that that makes. Bear in mind it was 1 minute 22 before. We'll just wait for this to go through the rendering process. And I'm fairly confident that this isn't going to take 1 minute 22. This is going to be a lot quicker. And as you can see, we're practically whizzing through this now. There we go. So what we've got, if I just minimize this down a little way, move things around a bit so I can accommodate my other render on screen. Just move this around a little bit. What we're seeing here is there is actually a distinct difference between these two images. What I've got on this one is this is a lot smoother and we're getting much better areas of shadows in under here than we are there and also around the base as well. So I'm a lot happier actually with this. I'm also a lot happier with the fact that it only took 16 seconds. So that's something to bear in mind as well. So okay, we've just discovered that by turning on the light tracer, we not only get a quicker render, we get a better quality render. But let's see if we can improve that 16 seconds, shall we? And really, without sort of going into absolutely every single option here, I'm just going to talk about a few of them. First one to talk about is the raise per sample. Now, as I've already stated, that per sample, what you're really talking about is per pixel. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to reduce that down. Now, that might seem like a strange thing to do until we look at what's called the filter size here. Now, the filter size is actually the size of each one. It's the diameter of each one of those uh, rays. So if you think we've got 125 rays here, but they were all at 0.5 of a unit, whatever the, the base unit is, uh, in size. If I was to make those 2.5, what that means is that although there are less samples in the scene, they're actually bigger, so they're going to overlap a lot more. You may think, well, actually, that's going to give you a less accurate render, but in actual fact, remember, what we're trying to do here is just a sort of a simple, even lighting. We're not, we haven't put yet into this scene a key light. All we've really done is sort of put our fill lights in, and, you know, the backlight, but more sort of this even fill colour. So that's something to bear in mind. If I now press render, and remember last time we took 16 seconds, I'm expecting this to take a lot less than 16 seconds. If I just move this out of the way so that we can see our render time down here in the bottom of the screen, you can see in actual fact what we've got is 10 seconds of render time. So already I've knocked out six seconds. So we've come down from one minute 22 to 16 to 10 seconds per frame. So I'm quite happy with that. We have got quite a bit of mottling in here. It's not noise, that's different. What we had before was a high frequency noise. What this is, is a very low frequency mottling. However, what we do have is a very even lighting scheme whereby outside is brighter than inside here because these obviously these surfaces are closer together. But what I can do now is if I close this down, if I now take my camera and I move to a completely different view, there we go, and I press the render button again, what I'm going to get is something that's going to be very, very close to 10 seconds. Now, depending on how much of the scene we've got in the viewport, depends on really on, on you know how long it's going to take to render. There you go, that was 11 seconds. There's possibly just a little bit more in the scene than there was before. But still, we've not gone up to the 16 or 17 seconds that we had before. So pretty much I'm quite happy with that. And what I'm going to do as well 
is just to show how good that could be is I'm going to put a few materials on here just to sort of spice things up a little bit. So I will select all three of these teapots and I will then open up my materials editor and I'm going to take this standard blue material that we've got here and I'm going to add it onto those objects and that's already been set up with a little bit of specularity and a little bit of a ray trace reflection as well so nothing particularly fantastic in there and I'll change here we go if I just change my viewport down here and we'll come in a little bit further now this is going to increase our render time a little bit obviously because I've got more in the scene and I've got a ray trace reflection but if I just render that very very quickly uh, perhaps I'll pause the video and we'll come back to this in a moment so now we put the render time up to 32 seconds that's mainly because of the materials but what we've got is this lovely even lighting over our scene and that's great, but what I want to do is maybe improve that a little bit. So we'll close this down. I'll come out a little way. Maybe just reposition my render so it doesn't my uh, camera position so it doesn't take so long to render. And we'll come back to our settings. Now bear in mind we still don't have a key light in here, but what I am going to do is maybe change this filter size down to two, maybe increase the rays per sample just up very very slightly. And I'm going to increase, so that's going to smooth things out a little bit, we know that. But I'm going to change this option here called Bounces. And I'm going to make the Bounces 1. Really what that's going to be is the rays that are, that are shining into the, the scene aren't just going to stop there. They're going to bounce up once. And that's going to lighten around the bottom area of our uh, teapots a little bit. So I'm just going to re-render now. And we'll have a look and see what the result is. And of course I'll pause and we'll come back in a moment. So now with this render you can see we're still getting, getting a little bit of mottling going on here but we're getting a much nicer look and feel underneath these teapots here. You can see where the light has hit and then bounced up. Where you would expect this to be slightly lighter in these regions just at the bottom of the teapots there is actually a little bit of extra light in this so that's quite nice. So the last thing for me to do while I'm using my default scanline renderer with this is to just pull out a little way come around and actually far I should really be doing this in the perspective view I'm going to go to full screen there and let's just pull out a little way and I'm going to make a key light so I'll make a standard target spotlight we'll put this in the scene and then I'll just drag that up and we'll make some ray traced shadows and with our shadow parameters, we'll make these about 0.5 because we don't want them to be too heavy, do we? So now I can come back in in my camera view. Let's just position this around a little bit, give ourselves a nice sort of idea of what's going on. Zoom in. There we go. And let's press the render button once more and just have a look at what that's going to look like. You know what I haven't done, though? One reasonably golden rule is I need to check what the intensity of that is. That's white. And in actual fact, I need to make that a little bit more yellowy so we've got more of a daylight feel. And also, under my rendering environment, I probably need to change that to 0.5. Now, that's because we, uh, we don't want the, um, the default light in 3D Studio Max to burn out the work that our key light's going to be doing here. So I'll put that up to about 1.25. And then we'll just re-render again and we'll have a look at the result that we get. So now what you can see is we've got a lovely image here. Now it's got a really nice look, a really nice feel to it. I like the materials, the way they're reflecting off each other, the way they're reflecting the environment. Uh, it did take 1 minute 49. Um, I will admit that. However, there is an awful lot of ray tracing going on within this scene. If I was to take the ray tracing off, um, then that 1 minute 49 would really come down. I mean, if we just take this off, I mean, we won't get the same feel to it, but I'll just do it quickly. We'll make a clone of that. Um, we'll just press render again. And I'm fairly confident that the render time that we would get wouldn't be 149. It would be a lot less. So 
it's not really the the light tracer that's causing that issue with the time it's the material that's causing the issue with the time so really just to prove uh, and do sort of a control test as it were uh, we'll just wait for this to finish and even then without the reflections we still have a really nice really even look and feel and we can see that as it's rendering out in front of us really nice really clean feel as well it's one that I like a lot so I'll just pause that until it finishes and there you go what we've got is these nice slightly darker areas right down at the bottom of the teapots we've got even lighting all the way around them and in actual fact that was 47 seconds so you can see just by having the shiny materials on here you're adding an extra minute into your render time so that's probably worth remembering as well so that's just some of the basics of using um, the light tracer if I come back here and we go back to our advanced lighting here just have a look for a moment at uh, one or two of the other things that are going to be important to us. Um, if you've got a skylight in the scene and you want to change, there's a global multiplier and a skylights multiplier. I'm never sure why they put this in because if you have more than one skylight in your scene, you're going to get some strange effects. You're going to get a lot of blowout. However, what this does is this is like having another version of the multiplier. That you've got here in the skylight so looking at the uh, the global multiplier here they're values of one and you've got these multipliers here so it's kind of like it's mirroring really I'm not sure why they put that in there uh, we've got a color filter which is very similar to the environmental filter that we've got here and one thing that you want to be aware of is there's an option here called color bleed and color bleed is if I was to have a, an orange color here it would start to bleed up the side of this blue and change the color now that is what would happen in the real world, but it also has to be controlled. So what I would say is be very, very careful about what you change this to, because I would maybe change this down to about a 0.2 if I was doing this in production. I'd never sort of really leave it at one if I was that concerned, which means I would allow a little bit of color bleed, but not a huge amount. So really, without getting too technical, those are the main things that you really need to know about for using your light tracer and for using your skylight options as well. It's a very simple, very easy, very neat way of working that provides you with a very even light source. Used mainly for outdoor environments, I wouldn't necessarily use this, use this if I was trying to light an indoor scene. Um, it is more for the outdoor scene, but it is very, very effective nonetheless.